Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. We've had some fantastic guests over the last four, five, six weeks. I'm pleased to announce that our sponsor for the show, Bridge Bank, but I know we need some more episodes. So I'm excited to get involved with some more guests and share some more marketing knowledge to the business owners that are joining us for the episode. This week, we've had, a, we've had some fascinating guests on the show. This week's no different. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Jim Butcher to the show. Hi, James. Hi there. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on board. But and anybody who doesn't know James from his, from his previous history, James has now managed and run four separate businesses and um, been responsible for a gold market sales and marketing strategy within all of them. So a fantastic guest to have on the show to share his knowledge. Um, just before we dive into a little bit more of James' background, I've got a little statement from our, our podcast sponsors. So if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at scale. Sometimes you just need faceless video reels to help get the content out there. The problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look naked to social. And that actually hinders their performance and is the performance of the content. So Bridbank.io is a database of endless vertical, authentic video clips. Great for pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. So if you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul and go to gridbag.io, pop that in and uh, let me know what you think. Um, coming back to the podcast then, James, um, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, as I've said. Um, the first thing I'm going to lead with is your fun fact for the day. Some people take that as a, as a personal thing and, and kind of relay some of the other... We had Irina on a couple of weeks back and managed to use, use super glue on her mouth instead of some Vaseline for her lips or something. I, I can't quite remember. That was, that was an interesting uh, admission, which I think she regretted in the end, to be fair to her. Yours is much more business related. I'll spare your audience some of my disasters. Mine, I think, is really relevant to this. It's just, it's just statistics someone shared with me ages ago from, I believe it was Sheffield University did some research, certainly a Northern English University, which is if you're someone that can highlight a problem, to a prospect, there's an 80% chance that you can be the person to win that business. And I think that actually going out there and quite happily, but going actually, look, here's what you probably didn't know and here's what something that's different, are really backing yourself. That's, yeah, you highlight that issue for someone, an 80% chance that you basically become the trusted advisor and help them solve that. I think it's very pertinent and who knows, might come up again over the next 15 minutes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it sounds like something that you, I'm guessing you've grasped up to it because it's something that you hold close and dear to you as well. Like it's, and it's worked for you in the past. So be interested to cover that up a little bit. I, I, if I remember a quote that I, I was told when I started selling SaaS software about four or five years ago, it was along the lines that the more senior you get to in terms of who you need to pitch a product to or a service to, the more job you need to do to highlight, to, to, to time with what you said, you need to highlight something new to them. They probably already know all the problems that are in the marketplace that are commonplace that most people try and solve. But if you highlight something brand new to them, that's how you sell to certainly C-suite, director level and CEOs of businesses. So I, I think that ties in quite nicely with what you said. And, Certainly something I've experienced. Oh, I, 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 absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. It's, um, to your point, you just actually, if you're turning up something new, it's getting them to stop in their tracks and think differently. And ultimately, that means that if you're selling to somebody lower down that purchasing food chain, mm -hmm. um, somebody on the technical, if it's SaaS software or an engineering manager in a factory, it's arming them with that. Go and take so they can get their boss's attention with, Hey boss, did you know that we're losing this much money over here? The uh, just get, getting people to think different because then you've got their attention. You can engage and you can you can enthuse about something in a different way because you've got their undivided attention rather than yeah, sound, sounding like the same thing they've heard ten times in the last month. Exactly. That. So then, could I actually just rewind a little bit, James? If you could share with us some of the experience that you've had in your career, how have you gotten where you are? Because 
like me, I think you, I qualified as a software engineer many years ago, and I believe you qualified as an actual engineer. Somebody who does, somebody actually does the work and <laughs> not, not sits behind a keyboard um, and pretends to do the work like me. <laughs> um, yeah, lo lovely way to, to think of it. But yes, I, yeah, started my career as an engineer. So I qualified, I did a degree in electrical and electronic engineering, albeit I majored in software and basically cut my teeth as a general engineer. I worked in all sorts of things. I literally made pieces for nuclear submarine, submarines, battery chargers for helicopters, things for electrostatically spraying seed potatoes. It was like, yeah, all sorts of just, but it was a great grounding, which I think has actually set me up for success in many ways. For my first experience in terms of running, growing, exiting a business, I was number six into a business in Nottingham, where I'm, I'm speaking to you today. And we basically invented a new solution around printing best before dates on bags, literally date codes on bags of crisps, whatever it might be. It was, I think, one of those first examples of actually turning up and saying, actually, look, there's a, you've got a completely different problem because people were thinking about reliability of the machinery, but the old jumble printers of stamping on packs were doing all sorts of things like if you punching holes in packs and there was, there was no ability for any low level traceability. So we basically, we took a business, I say I was employing them, built a product rather than a service, took that um, internationally. Um, took some of the largest orders in that industry in the globe at the time. Uh, a million pounds might not seem a lot now, but that basically was enough to fit out the entirety of um, the 200 plus walkers packaging lines in the UK at that time. We took that on to do a trade sale, worked in a larger organization and gave my experience in terms of working in global sales and marketing. That product is still a global market leader 20 years later. So it was evidence to the job that we did, I'm still proud of. Left, started a software business to actually control packaging machinery back in the days before the cloud. So it was on-premise software, but a very different experience launching a software business. And again, it was about changing things. It's, people make so many mistakes in factories, but they just live with them because they go, it's human error. So they have a computer that tells them what best before they print on a pack. They then write that down somewhere to go and type essentially into another computer on the production line rather than going, if I can join these two computers together, they didn't think of them as computers because packaging machinery, but join them together, remove human error, and actually have enormous benefits around in terms of shelf life, availability, et cetera. Again, took that on to be another trade sale in parallel with another machinery business at the time. So I actually had my feet in two camps at that point in time. That led me into consulting in the retail space where I had the pleasure of working with some of the big retailers like Asda, Sainsbury's, Tesco, and some of their best practice. And led me into the area I've spent the last decade as I was CEO of a company called Supply Pilot, which was helping the major retailers, such as some of our named or Walmart in America or Woolworths in Australia, engage their suppliers to drive change and sustainability. Um, a lot of parallels of how you drive change with sales and marketing, interestingly, because it's about getting people to do what you want them to do. That was a trade sale in the autumn of last year. Uh, since then, I've returned to independent consulting, which I've done in between along the way. So I do business advising, non executive directors, chairs, etc., as well as business speaking. So the areas that are close to my heart about driving change and sustainability, as well as just general business advice. So hopefully very relevant today, people literally, how do you grow and scale a business? I've been there from startup, whether it be seed funding or VC funding, going creating markets, positioning your brand. So yeah, welcome the chance to share some of that experience. A lot of it's from learning through your own mistakes. Yeah, share some of those. It's an interesting journey in that some might say what you've done is be a really good generalist. And I hate the word generalist because I don't believe in it. I actually believe that somebody who has done so many different roles and profiles, you do it because there's an underlying thing that you're very good at and it's a the ability to be flexible in what you do. And I'm, I, I come from a similar sort of background. I've done lots and lots of different roles. And I've been successful at each of them purely because there's an underlying set of tasks that are done in each job that I've gotten immense satisfaction from, which motivates me to do the other thing. I'd imagine it's something similar for yourself from the sound of things. Um, I certainly do. Interesting you use the word generalist. Someone's once described me as a specialist generalist. <laughs> yep. I thought it was a very interesting way of putting it. 
I think a lot of it goes back to the engineering background, which, as you said, Paul, we share a bit, albeit just on the software side. I think because it's problem solving. For me, when I was consulting with retail, it was helping them solve the problem, not of how to have a best practice, but how do I stop making mistakes in my supply chain? How do I improve sustainability? How do I improve traceability, et cetera? I think a lot of running a business is problem solving. It's whether they be internal with people, skills, et cetera. The, I've always um, leaned, leaned towards the go-to-market side of things. So even though I started as an engineer, um, I very quickly decided I didn't want to spend my life sat behind a computer screen and therefore went from engineering into project management, into account management, into sales management. I think a career that took about you know, 18 months, 20 months, it was a very natural thing. But it goes right back to my fun fact. I actually think really good salespeople are, it's about solving a problem for somebody. There are many books that talk about solution selling or versions of that, like spin selling, et cetera. It's, it's about being able to articulate and understand the client's problem and then articulate how whatever you're going to do is going to help them solve that problem. So I think it's the problem solving side. I'm also relatively gregarious, which is probably, again, why I ended up in go-to-market stuff rather than sat behind a computer, because there's nothing more I enjoy actually working with people in person. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I guess for me, there's, a, there's something in that determination to change things for people, the desire to solve problems. I, I think I actually genuinely believe that if a really good salesperson, a natural, as, as most people would term, a natural salesperson, always comes at things where commercials are almost a secondary thought. It's not. It's a place of value and service, like genuine desire to solve the problems and issues for people. And the fact that money comes out the back end of that is just a, a side effect. And I always find like the people that are, Todd Capone says it really well, salespeople are coin operated, if that's the way you treat them. It boils down from the culture yeah, of the business the... down to. I, I, I think it's also quite interesting because in that context, I've never viewed myself as being a great salesperson. Actually, I think I'm more a marketeer and actually the go to market strategy first and foremost, but. I've also been very fortunate, which I've only ever sold what I genuinely think is the best at what it is and everything I've done. Now, yeah. some of that, if you pass it to inventing it, you're going you're gonna to think, I don't know. But I remember going back to that early career where we were launching innovative new equipment. I was bumping into the same sales guys and I was winning 80% of the time, which is great. And I was enjoying the bonus and it was all fantastic. But I actually remember, I still remember, don't know I don't know if Phil Thomas is still in the industry. If he does, here's a shout out. Is he, he, he was a better salesman guy than me because he beat me 20% of the time, but I got the best product by a long way. Yeah. So it's really interesting when I think about it, it's, it when selling. It's the, so yeah, yeah, fortunate, made it that way, et cetera. I don't know. But I think there's, and that's possibly one of the tips to some of the SME owners that could be listening here is knowing when to go and hire a sales. In an early stage, an entrepreneurial business, being your own advocate, having that enthusiasm, knowing it inside out, et cetera, is really important to win those early adopters, those innovators, anyone's familiar with, you know, crossing the chasm. That's the first part of launching a new product or service. Anyone not familiar with that expression, I recommend go get the book and read Crossing the Chasm. It's a really interesting insight into, you know, growing a business and turning mainstream. But there comes a point where you've got to know your own strengths and say, actually, what I need is I need a sales guy who is happy to literally just, you know, knock on the doors every day and do what it takes, takes to make this happen. So, yeah, that's one of the things is knowing what your skill is. Being out, being the best person to close a deal isn't necessarily the best person to start a deal, for example. So, yeah, just recognizing where your strengths and weaknesses are. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's fair. And... It leads in quite nicely to some of the conversation that you've said there around one of the one of the main questions that I ask each guest is for you, if you were to advise a, an SME who's just starting out their own business right now, whether it's products or services, what's the one bit of marketing advice that, that you would give to them that will drive the most success for them in the coming years or keep them afloat at least? I think so. 
this is partly based on my own experience, but now as an independent advisor, I'm talking to a number of different businesses. And it's really about knowing who is your target customer, who's that target audience, and staying laser sharp in terms of trying to talk to that audience. There's a lot of talk at the moment. If I step back a little bit, um, the world changed with COVID. People aren't in offices. It was hard enough to get, get past the receptionist to talk to somebody four years ago. But people aren't in the office anymore. They don't go to events the same as they used to before. Getting to talk to the person, say, that right person is really hard. And therefore, there's lots of people selling marketing advice of here's how you create lots of content and send it to everybody. And it's all about scattergramming everything. And you basically lose, you lose sight of your own messaging and you lose sight of the target. So it's clearly, it's very different if you've got a large scale you know, B2C business where everyone's a prospective customer or a B2B business where you're actually so supply pilot. We were trying to talk to the major retailers. There are only 10 in the UK, arguably not, maybe not in a suit tent. It's a short list. You, know, you don't need to be in every newspaper to talk to them because you know where they live, kind of thing obsessed with the number of followers, the number of clicks, the number of views, because that's what all the tools are all set them up to do. So there's somebody I know on the sustainability front, they were really focused on saying to people, look, you, you need to truly do a life cycle analysis and truly understand the, the depth of where all the carbon is in your product. Then their marketing, they were getting to all sorts of issues and conversations with people around, let's comment on this packaging change. Let's comment on this over here which is actually fueling the let's do little bits and pieces. Let's just change the packaging. Let's just do this. Because packaging is really easy. for Everyone's got packaging, so everyone talks about it. But your message just gets diluted and lost. Really make sure you know who your target is and put your effort into how do you speak to those people. And if it's really hard, then that's possibly good because it might, might be generally a blue ocean for you to go and find something other people can't do. But if you don't do that, you also will never really know whether you're winning or losing yeah you might have something your target audience don't want but if you can speak to them you can learn you can evolve etc if you just get busy trying to say i've got more clicks than everybody else on linkedin tiktok bar this etc it's diluted so apologies that's quite a rambling answer but it's just no, not at all. quite ironic given the advice is stay focused it's <laughs> just your rambling answer but it's really understand who you want to talk to and if i can go to a second one i think and with that Make sure your sales process is therefore fit for purpose. So again, there's lots of people selling, here's the, here's the fantastic sales model, here's how it works, etc. Yeah, it's very different if you're trying to sell a widget for somebody to available, relevant to, I don't know, you know, every man over 40, you've got an audience of 10 million to go at. It's it can be a very simple volume-based funnel. If you've got a complex SaaS sale, for example then actually you're, you won't sell to one person. You're going to have to get multiple stakeholders. You need to make sure you know who the financial buy-in is, who this leader is, how do I take it to CTO, and therefore there's tools. So we adopted Miller-Hyman, for example, in the last business as a way of reviewing those complex sales. Um, but it's making sure what you've got is appropriate for what you're trying to sell because, sadly, there's rarely a quick fix. And that's, I think, why people get sucked into the numbers thing is if I can throw enough mud on there, I'm going to get something. And not necessarily, you might just spend an awful lot of money marketing badly to lots of the wrong people. I think there's two things that probably clear of is, one, people are, there's, there's so many things to that to fair point. People are scared of talking to a, a, a very niche potential client base rather than their total possible market because they're worried that they'll lose customers who might hear their message, but it doesn't um, pertain well to them because they've been targeted at specifically a really small niche customer section. And for those people who are worried about that, I, I've done both. I can promise you that Talking to everyone, you are just shouting into the void and you'll get very little response back. You might get some response, but it won't. It'll be hard to work. It'll be hard to win. And the likelihood is it won't convert. When you start to get much more niched, and I'm still perfecting this, I'm still learning it, and it's never a finished process, the more niche you can be, the easier the conversations are when people do respond. And the more likely people are to respond because they feel like you're talking directly to them. 
And then I think the other side of things. Absolutely. With that absolutely. Is, but, but I think it's but what you've, once you've got that audience, linking back to where we came into the conversation, you've got to make sure you're talking about their problem. They, they want to talk, you know, how are you going to solve their problem? They don't want to know, know what your sexy new widget is. When I'm inviting and talking to people early in their journey from a consulting point of view, even just looking at their investor decks, everyone wants to say they've got AI now or they're using blockchain. And my question to all of them is, do I want blockchain? Yeah. Why is that clever? Yeah. Haven't you just added complications, cost processing issues with my clients are going to talk about the green impact, et cetera. Yeah. If there's a really good reason, tell me the problem you're solving. The fact that it actually happens to be solved by blockchain is probably on page four. Yeah. Tripping into these buzzwords and talking about you. And again, just like you, you were humbling enough stable. Yeah. I, I, rec I know this. I've made the mistake. We've been there. And I still make the mistake. It's very easy to fall back into the trap when you get excited about something. But you've got to make sure you're talking to them about, here's the problem you've got or the opportunity you could have. Yeah. Ideally, I'm the first person to tell you, because as we've already said, I just spent chance I now get the order. But then how am I going to actually solve that for you is what really makes all of the difference. I think the best explanation I heard that, that kind of you need to ruminate on it a little bit. It's not something that, that when you hear it, it's really powerful. But then, then there's a moment of, so how do I do that? Is if I was selling a swimming pool to someone, I'm not actually selling the swimming pool. What I'm selling is them having a relaxing afternoon on a Friday after they finish work, swimming in their pool in their garden. And the feelings that go with that, they don't care about whether there's a swimming pool or not. What they care about is that afternoon of relaxation that's what they're passionate about because that's where the emotion comes in and so if you're a business owner regardless of what you sell regardless of whether it's services or products you need to capitalize on feelings and the relief like i always say to people think about what they must mourn to their partner about over the dinner table when the kids are in bed what are the things that keep them up at night or to your point earlier on what are the things that, that indicate there's something that, that's a problem but they don't know even what the problem is. They just know what's causing a problem for them. I mean, it, it, it might be that they're three steps away and you need to take them on that journey to say, do you know what? You probably feel this. And that's because of this. And that is an indicator of this problem yeah. here, which we solve. It's, yeah. it's, all, it's also being relatable, isn't it? You're not gonna, you're not gonna go and market to a, a street of ex council houses trying to sell them swimming the swimming pools. Yeah, so it can be a swimming pool example. A real simple example, technical service company, a really good company that's been a supplier to me in the past. I can recommend without question, but was looking at their go to market strategy and their target customers are SMEs. But they've also been fortunate enough, they've done projects with big organizations like the NHS in the past, right? So they've put those logos on their webpage and say, hey, we've worked with the NHS, we've worked with us, or whatever it might be. If you're trying to sell to an SME, you've just made it unrelatable. Right? Yeah. We made the mistake, again, we learned from mistakes. When we, our first client on the global scale as supply pilot, used to be called S4RB, was Walmart. And we were very proud, as we should have been, that we basically landed Walmart as a client. But we shouted about it to the point that actually lunch, even other big global retailers were going, cool, we can't afford it. Walmart are buying, we can't afford it. We're going, no, no. Yeah. You see, we completely missed the point. You've got to be relatable. And this is where knowing who you want to talk to um, is a challenge. I mentioned in a flash just there, we used to be called S4RB. But so we, the business I got involved in doing this supply chain software 10 years ago was called S4RB, Solutions Retail Brands. Um, we rebranded around the time of COVID to focus more around sustainability for a number of reasons. One is we all really want to make an impact on sustainability. Retail wasn't listening to us because they were too busy about supply chain issues of COVID. But we'd spent years building an audience in retail where actually, so what we do is just as relevant to CPG brands like an SC Johnson or wherever it might go, or, um, and actually redefining that and re-messaging was a real challenge. It's one of the, one of the things I'm most proud of, of what we've achieved because we did it well and obviously we've done it well enough that we went on to sell the business. So obviously it was a call out success, but it's really interesting when you just look back and go, it's not just what you say, it's all those subliminal messages. Like I say, of sticking 
these big logos on your thing, who do I want to talk to? So it comes back to that same learning of really going, what's my process and who do I want to sell to? And it's much more valuable to spend my time having four really good conversations this month where I'm going to go and sell two of those guys than having 400 poor, poor conversations that are diluting all of the effort in those early stage businesses. So coming back to the same point. So then I guess just before we, we wrap up for the episode, what's in a, in a similar vein, what's one thing that you wish small business owners would stop wasting time, effort, money, whatever on in, in their early stages that is actually hindering them or just a waste of time and money? Uh, I think it's, been, it's a risk of a little bit of repetition, but it's this. What I really need to know is to make sure, you know, what does a good order look like? Probably think of it that way. Right? Just ignore sales and market for a second. What does a good order look like? Right? That's going to be a size of order, location, type of customer, market, etc. Right? And then go, okay, who do I want to talk to where that's going to be a good order? The definition has got to be good for them. They're not going to place the order. Why is it good for me? And therefore learning to say no. Right? Any good sales guy, and the use expression of coin operated, and some of the best ones are coin operated, just wind up and they're going to go to see, is the, is they're ruthless at going, I'm not going to talk to that person because they're not going to place an order. I'm going to get permission. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Yeah. So it's really about having those quality conversations that are focused on the customer and the value, not on more and more clever, exciting ways to describe why my widget's the sexiest, best, whatever, because that's not what people are doing. They're buying swimming pools. What's the idea? People don't buy drills, they buy holes. It's that kind of, it's what are, what are you really doing for them? What's that real value? And that's not, that's not just in their sales and marketing. It's in everything that they do, their product management choices. If you've got a cloud-based software business, are the developers building the features that are essential to get those projects that are going to be successful? Or is everyone getting busy adding all sorts of things that might really be needed in three years' time? It, it ripples, ripples across the whole business. So it's it's being focused on that. Again, my engineering background, um, studied a lot around Lean, Six Sigma, et cetera. They've got this expression, go to Gemba. So it's Japanese term. I think the literal meaning is the real place. In Six Sigma terms, it's where the work is done. Right? Get out. Go visit your customers, go into their factory and, and look at the problems they've got to make sure it's a fit, etc. So you're talking their language, not your jargon, their problem, not your sexy toy. And that ultimately will fuel. Yeah, you will hit a rich scene where you go, fantastic, I've suddenly found a way that's really relevant to these people. And then I might want to throw volume. I want to put my money in through and I'm going to really chase that. Now I'm now I've got a rich seam. I'm going to mine it for all its work. But that's the thing in the early days. It's finding where those are, having the confidence to stay focused when actually the orders aren't coming at quite the pace you want to do. And sadly also having the confidence where you go, I really have this tried this long and if I need to go mining somewhere else now, but at least I've stuck to my guns and therefore I really know whether it's worked or not. I oh, hope everybody who's listening to the show got an absolute ton out of today's episode. I think it's been really insightful. I've really enjoyed chatting with you, James. If anybody wants to reach out and find a bit more about what you're currently doing, how can they find you? Easiest way, look, find me on LinkedIn. Got examples of somewhere I do. Got some examples of my talking. You'll recognize this ugly mug on the picture. So, yeah, just James Butcher. The company is in the but Yeah, just find me on LinkedIn and I'm very happy to speak if I can share my value. Perfect, and I'll make sure you're in the show notes of the of the James, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much for coming on the show, and uh, I hope you have a fantastic week. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show, or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specializes in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content 
taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.